Thank you for listening to Depictions Media Radio. Good morning, I'm Dr. Bonnie Henry, BC's Provincial Health Officer, and on the line uh, in Vancouver today is uh, Minister of Education, Jennifer Whiteside, who will be uh, uh, speaking after um, my remarks this morning. I want to start by acknowledging that today, and the day after our day of reflection, um, I'm very grateful to be here on the traditional and unceded territories of the Lekungun speaking people, the traditional keepers of this land, now the Esquimalt and Songhees First Nation, and I hope that we will all continue the reflection that we started yesterday in our first official day of truth and reconciliation, or reconciliation, and have meaningful progress towards reconciliation with Indigenous peoples across this province. Over the last few weeks, we have listened to parents, teachers, and others in our school communities about their needs for this school year knowing that we are in a very different position than we were last September with the highly effective vaccines that we have in place. That has made a huge difference in our schools across the province. But we also recognize we are facing a more infectious strain of the virus this year, and there are still many children who are not yet able to be protected. As we saw in the data I presented on Tuesday, we have seen a steady rise in COVID-19 diagnoses in school-aged children, particularly those 5 to 11 years of age who are not yet eligible for vaccination, and particularly a rapid increase in the last two weeks. The majority of COVID transmission continues to occur in homes and through social networks, and we've seen that throughout this pandemic. But we are also seeing a significant increase in testing in school-aged children, and I've showed that those data as well this week. Nevertheless, increased diagnoses has led to increased numbers of potential exposure events and several school outbreaks have also been um, detected and reported. COVID-19 continues to circulate in our communities and schools reflect this. More cases, clusters and outbreaks are occurring in communities where vaccination rates are lowest and this has resulted in a number of additional regional orders, as we know, and regional interventions will continue to remain an important part of our approach in this phase of our pandemic. Our school teams are committed to ensuring we are taking all necessary measures to ensure schools can continue to provide that all-important in-school learning for children in BC. We know the absolute importance of the social, emotional, and physical growth that occurs in schools and the importance of this to the health and well-being of children's and children and families across BC. We have reviewed these data and the information we have from the first month of return to school, and today I am extending the mask, uh, the PHO masking order in schools to cover all students and staff in K-12 to across the province. This order will be in place for the remainder of this school term additional layer to help reduce risk of transmission in classrooms and schools. I want to extend my heartfelt thanks to all of the school staff, educators, and families who have supported the return to school for over 600,000 children across BC. We know this is the best and safest place for them to be, even more so when COVID is circulating in your community or in the province. And this additional measure we are putting in place today is one more layer that will ensure we can continue to engage and support children through this ever-changing pandemic. We will continue to do this in a way that supports the positive aspects that children need to have to be able to wear masks effectively in these settings. I've been talking to a lot of young people in my life over the last few weeks, and I know that uh, they can adapt to this. They've been learning. We've had those first few weeks of school to help get used to it again. And I am so impressed by how resilient and adaptable children are. And wearing your mask gives you superpowers. It makes you a superhero. It means that you're protecting yourself, but you're also looking out for your classmates in your school and your community. We also know that vaccination is the best thing parents and all others in the school communities can do 
to protect children and youth, particularly those who are too young to be vaccinated yet. We are thankful that COVID remains mostly a mild disease in children, but we do not want any child to be ill, and we're taking measures to prevent as much illness as we can. I know that these measures will assist in stopping other respiratory illnesses that we're starting to see as well, and we know that made a difference last year. Right now, we're starting to see things like enteroviruses and adenoviruses that cause those common colds, and we're also seeing a bit of parainfluenza and RSV, all things that can make children ill with respiratory illnesses that can look an awful lot like COVID. It remains critically important that we do those daily health checks and keep children out of the school environment if they are unwell. And I ask workplaces to continue to be flexible, to support parents so that they can um, get through this next few months as we navigate this phase of our pandemic. We will also be making sure that all of those other important in-class and in-school measures that help reduce transmission of respiratory viruses um, are in place and optimized as we head into this respiratory season. Everything from reduced mixing of classes, staggering break times, reducing people in the school system, particularly if they're not vaccinated, and things like ventilation and increasing outdoor activities. All of these are important layers, and adding masks is just one more. I also want to speak to parents. We know how important the social activities and extracurricular activities are for children for their growth and well-being, whether it's sports or music, we know that these are important for many children in supporting their ability to learn. And we are committed to keeping these going as much as possible as well. And that's why these are so particularly important. If you are living in an area where transmission is increased, it's all the more important that everybody around you are vaccinated so that we can keep these things growing. We need to know for the next few months particularly, we need to keep the priority on the school. And this might mean keeping other social activities outside of school smaller or more limited. Knowing these high rates of vaccination are so protective and are making the difference in allowing all of these other important social interactions to occur too. We've been committed to providing as much data as we can or as we have to our school communities. And the team of BCCDC has been working with our education partners and schools to develop a more detailed school-specific report. Our first report will be available in the middle of October, and we will then provide data and a report monthly um, that we'll be able to provide to, to parents, to school communities, and to the public. We know school is an important part of a young person's life for their health and well-being, and it is a safe place for many, many children. And we know that this has been a challenging time for all of our children as we navigate these ever-changing trials and tribulations of this pandemic. It is about learning, seeing friends, getting that important emotional and mental health support, and we need to do everything we can to safely continue this. These efforts are about supporting students, parents, educators, and everyone who make our schools an even safer and more welcoming place to be. I'll now turn it over to Minister Whiteside. Good. Good morning, everyone. I'm Jennifer Whiteside, BC's Minister of Education, and I am pleased to join you this morning from the traditional territory of the Squamish, Musqueam, and Tsleil-Waututh people. And that acknowledgement today does uh, have particular meaning, I think, as we reflect on our collective experiences uh, across our communities, our province, and our country uh, yesterday as we commemorate Orange Shirt Day and the first National Day of Truth and Reconciliation. It's a pleasure to be here with you this morning. I wanted to say that, you know, we, we're now a month into uh, the new school year and hundreds of thousands of children across BC are enjoying being back in school with their friends, learning in class with their teachers, playing outside, playing sports, or taking part in band practice. And as we have known uh, since the beginning of the pandemic, in-person learning is absolutely essential to students' emotional and uh, mental well-being, as well as for their intellectual development. And from the beginning of the pandemic as well, our top priority has been the safety of all students, teachers, and staff. And we would not have gotten through this in the way that we have without the incredible 
work uh, uh, and commitment and dedication of our educators, of school staff, school leadership, district leadership, trustees, rights holders, uh, everyone working together across our education system to put kids at the center of all that we do. It's why we've worked so closely with the public health officer, the BC Centre for Disease Control, to develop health and safety guidelines that keep everyone safe while allowing that crucial full-time in-person learning to occur. A year and a half now into the pandemic, our experience tells us that COVID exposures in schools are indeed a reflection of what is happening in the surrounding community. That continues to be true. We've developed health and safety guidelines for all schools in BC that reflect the current situation with the COVID-19 pandemic. And in August, we announced that the mask mandate that was in place uh, last school year would continue for all students in grades 4 to 12, uh, along with the uh, strong recommendation for mask wearing for students in kindergarten to grade 3. And I want to say that in, with respect to our school safety plans, we in fact maintained many of the measures that were in place uh, last year to protect our school communities and to provide continuity. I, and I want to take a moment to thank uh, school boards in particular who have led their districts through a very challenging time and who continue to work closely with health authority school medical officers in their regions to support the school safety plans. And indeed, as Dr. Henry has noted, today we are in a much different place uh, because this year we have vaccines. And we know that immunization protects communities and protects children. And the good news is that as of yesterday, 88.5% 80, of British Columbians have received their first dose and nearly 82% are fully vaccinated. We know the best protection for kids in our schools especially for those who are too young to receive a vaccine, is for everyone who is eligible to be vaccinated. And I am asking you now, if you have not yet had your shot, now is your time. We also know that the Delta variant of COVID is more transmissible, especially in areas with lower vaccination rates. And, and I too have had the opportunity to speak with many uh, parents, educators, some kids as well, members of our school communities, over the last few weeks. And I know that for many, the return to, to school is going well, and there's in, in many cases been minimal disruption from COVID. But for some, and particularly those communities experiencing high rates of COVID, there is a greater level of concern. And I know that many parents and members of our school communities right across the province will welcome these additional measures uh, to keep our kids safe. So this additional step gives families and parents more uh, reassurance, I think, about the, the safety of the school environment. You know, we've also heard uh, that parents want to be kept more up to date on what's happening, of course, in their, in their child's school. And that's why public health is now providing regular updates uh, on health authority websites about school exposures. And so in addition to, uh, to the announcement uh, that Dr. Henry has made with respect to the extension of the, of the masking requirements in the, uh, in, the, in the public health order, we will of course uh, update our, our education guidelines to reflect that, uh, to reflect that, that all um, children in school, from all students in school and staff from kindergarten to grade 12 uh, must wear a mask while they are inside schools, including while at their desks and on school buses. This builds on our current health and safety guidelines, which already, as you know, require masks uh, for students beginning in grade four in all public and independent schools. And, and again, with respect to notifications, I, I just want to reiterate that um, we uh, that where there is a um, uh, a new uh, an exposure in a school, uh, contact tracing continues to be in effect. And if your child has been uh, is at risk of an exposure uh, from COVID, you will be notified. And further to that, I, I think we will all welcome the report uh, that Dr. Henry has spoken to with respect to uh, um, a bit of a, a status update of what's happening uh, in, uh, in, in schools with respect to, uh, to the virus uh, and look forward to seeing that um, in, uh, in, in mid-October. So again, uh, you know, as Dr. Henry outlined, these new measures extend our current health and safety guidelines, and there are many elements of that plan that are very crucial to continue to uh, ensure our, our, that, that we are that the school communities are are are, um, are acting by uh, every day. Doing the daily health check every day is very important. It is important that both students and staff stay home while they're sick. 
Uh, we have hand washing regimes. We have all of the strategies uh, that are in place in our health and safety guidelines to reduce congestion and manage crowding in uh, in schools. We have school districts have been working very hard on ventilation, improving vent ventilation systems. Um, and uh, these measures, they're in, they were in place last year, they're in place this year. And uh, uh, just to remind folks that, of course, public health officials continue to monitor what's happening in our schools very closely and continue to work with school districts. We continue to work at a provincial, le provincial level with all of our education partners and to respond to changes as, as they occur. And that's, that's really what this is about today. So just by way of closing, to say again, um, the most important tool in our toolbox right now is vaccination, and we've been doing such a remarkable job across the province. Uh, but we need to we need to ensure we keep that going. And, and I strongly encourage anyone who has not yet had an opportunity to get vaccinated to go and do so. Thank you so much. And uh, I think Dr. Henry will uh, will start with with questions on that side. Thank you very much, Minister and Doctor. Welcome, everyone. A reminder to reporters on the line, please press star 1 to enter the queue. You may ask one question and one follow-up. A reminder as well, since we are in two separate locations today, you are welcome to address your question to the spokesperson of your desire, but we will probably start with Dr. Henry and uh, Minister Whiteside may follow up. Please be patient with us as we work through this. For the first question, we will go to the phone lines. Binder Sajjan, CTV News. Dr. Henry, I'm just wondering what uh, changed in the last three days. We were talking about this very issue on a Tuesday. Um, does this signify, like this move that you're making today, that you didn't have public confidence in your back-to-school plan? Uh, no, I don't believe that's it at all. We've been monitoring the data, and uh, I'm not the only person who makes these decisions. So it is something that uh, we have a large group of people who are working on. Uh, what it's public health, it's in partnership with the school districts, the parent advisory committees and others. So it was a matter of time once we had the data that we presented on Tuesday to look at what are the important measures that we need to do. So I uh, indicated, I thought quite clearly on Tuesday that uh, we these were things that we were looking at. We weren't at the place yet where we had that uh, all of the decisions made. And there do you have a follow-up? I do, um, and I know that this back to school plan was announced in late June, uh, promising a school year that was as normal as possible. So masks are a, a small step here, but why not mandate vaccinations for all adults in the school system and bring in portable air filtration for each classroom as Toronto has done? Um, I'll let the minister talk to the, the uh, um, ventilation question because um, I know a lot of work has been done on that. But, uh, it, it, you know, the, we strongly encourage everybody in the school system to be immunized. And we knew that in June. We knew that when we updated in August. We've been following that, of course, with messages every day um, since that time. One of the things that we, uh, that we know is that we're not seeing a lot of transmission. And the data I showed last week, or on Tuesday, uh, makes a big, it uh, shows that quite clearly, that in that older age group, um, in the 12 to, to 17, we've now started to ha see leveling off. We haven't seen transmission in the s uh, staff in school settings as much as we were seeing last year. So these tell us that the immunization program is working. And then the challenge, of course, is that everything we need to do now is to make sure that we're keeping the younger kids um, from getting infected with COVID um, over this next period of time until vaccine is available for them. So I think one of the other things that's really important is that uh, the local MHOs are working with each school. And when we see um, when we see people who are exposed or where there's uh, outbreaks or clusters in the school, those who are not immunized are excluded uh, from that environment, which we what we do for other um, uh, infectious diseases as well. And you know that means uh, that can be quite disruptive. So those are the other incentives to make sure that people are immunized. And uh, we know that there is very high rates of immunization in most school settings. And now we'll go to Vancouver to hear from Minister Whiteside. Thank you. And with respect to ventilation, uh, our government has invested $87.5 million over the last two years for districts to do the very important work 
of properly maintaining and upgrading uh, their HVAC systems. That work has been done by districts. We've been uh, working with partner groups in education to look at uh, uh, the, the fine details of uh, of how that work has, has unfolded and to look at those particular areas where there may need to be particular mitigation um, uh, efforts in place such as uh, portable air filters and those measures have been implemented by districts where, where warranted. For example, in Abbotsford, uh, the school district has invested in, uh, in, uh, in portable uh, air filtration systems in, uh, for deployment in classrooms uh, where they, uh, they are unable to, uh, to, to upgrade the, uh, the, the mechanical HVAC systems. For the next question, we continue on the phone lines. We go to Camille Baines, Canadian Press. Hi there, Dr. Henry. Uh, a few days ago, you mentioned it would take some time to post information on exposures and cases. On average, how many days is it taking? And if you could please walk me through the process, that would be great. Yeah, so it, it, it varies quite a lot depending on how many cases are in an area, how stretched our public health resources are. And as much as we're trying to ramp up the public health resources, there's a finite pool of people to do that work. So what happens is public health is notified when a positive lab laboratory test comes in. So we get automatic notification from the lab. So somebody has to be uh, a child, um, is, has some symptoms, they're taken for a test. The test result usually is within 24 hours. And we now have a process that parents um, or people who are tested themselves are automatically notified, usually by text, but it could be by email as well. And so you're likely to know at the same time that public health receives that notification. And when we receive that notification, there's, as you know from looking at our, our numbers every day, there can be hundreds of people that uh, are tested positive every day. So public health has a system where the intake looks at um, the age of the, the person, the setting that they're in. And so we prioritize school-age children, for example, to do that case follow-up. But it does mean that one of the public health team, uh, the case and contact management team, calls the parent, finds out the information about where the child was, what symptoms they have, where they were, who they were exposed to, because remember, we're still trying to to connect and, and look for clusters and outbreaks in our communities, in our schools, um, and also where they were during the period they were infectious. So it can take as short as 24 hours. That is our attempt, is to make sure that once we get that uh, positive lab report that we're trying to contact cases within 24 hours. But you can see that that may be a delay from when a parent knows that their child is ill and when they get uh, the test result back. And in some cases, particularly right now with the large number of, of cases that are occurring in the north and some parts of the interior, it can be a delay of two to three days. Um, but our attempt is to try and get to most cases within 24 hours. So once that case investigation is done and there's a determination that uh, the child or, or adult was in the school setting during their infectious period, and they had the type of contact that it might be uh, transmitted to others. And so things like, you know, was there mask wearing? Wh what types of activities were they uh, partake partaking in, et cetera? Uh, that's when uh, we put the notification out and contact those who were potentially exposed directly. And that's when it gets posted on the website. So I think we all need to recognize that th this does take time. And it is absolutely important for parents um, to, to know that if their child is sick and it does come back positive, you can share that information with those people that your child has had contact with. And I know there's been uh, uh, some reports of, of parents doing that, and I think that's great. We all need to support each other to do the best we can during this period of time. And public health is there to do our best to support you. And when we see um, that there's Sometimes we see a bigger picture because we do those detailed case investigations and that's when we can tell whether uh, there was an outbreak happening, where there was transmission, and we can link it between different classes and uh, sometimes it's related to siblings, or sometimes it's related to things, social events that happen outside of the school setting that we can actually see that um, bigger pattern as well. So it is all of us working together on this. 
to make sure that we're keeping children safe, that if our child is sick, keeping them home and away from others until they're feeling better. Camille, do you have a follow-up? Yes, please. Um, I'm also hearing that for some schools, the information being posted is um, quote-unquote selective, so that not all of the cases or exposures are being included, and parents are therefore still having to rely on each other or another online source that apparently posts verified information on its website. Could you please address those concerns? Yeah, so, uh, you know, there's always, um, there are many reasons, as I've talked about, while a child may be, or an adult in the school system, um, may not have been a risk while in the school, and uh, parents can share that information about their child's illness, but public health will be posting when there's a risk in the school. And, you know, they're just catching up with that now. And yes, sometimes uh, parents will know, and they'll know uh, the, the information from other parents prior to public health getting um, all of the pieces connected together. So I think we have to work together on this. This is not about, um, it's not about saying that uh, this is wrong. We'll never be able to catch up to somebody um, passing that information on as soon as they know what's going on. So let's all work together on this. It's not about us versus them and, and who's getting things right. It's about making sure we all have the information we need. Now we'll come to the room. The next question goes to Richard Zussman, Global News. Uh, to build on what Binder was asking, California has now announced they're mandating vaccines in the entire school system. That includes children as well, phasing in those under 12 when they're eligible for vaccine. With California doing this, other jurisdictions, why can't BC get ahead of this and get to this mandate, which many may think is inevitable? And also, we're... Um, uh, I will leave. I, I'll leave it there. Thanks. Yeah, yeah, we've talked about this many times. There's different ways um, that we can have conditions of employment that require immunization, and there's a whole lot of different um, pieces that go with that. So my responsibility under public health orders is to look at those highest risk environments that are in the health system. So that's what I'm focusing on from public health orders. We absolutely are supportive. There are many other higher risk environments where um, the virus can be transmitted between people and we think of group accommodations, uh, industrial camps, uh, prisons. Uh, you know, there are many settings where an employer needs to have those, um, uh, those policies for their own employees. Uh, I do. There are wide exemptions for masks right now on the government website. Are those exemptions still going to exist and who's going to be in charge of enforcing them? And on a separate issue, there's a petition circulating around concern uh, that uh, at Whistler Blackholm, there's no vaccine certificate required to ski and ride. Is the province considering adding uh, ski resorts as a place where the vaccine card will apply? Okay, <laughs> complex. Um, and I've forgotten your first question already. You got me to <laughs> oh, mask exemptions. So you know there are there are some people who have challenges wearing masks. We know that, and we've uh, put in place exemptions uh, that allow people uh, not to to wear masks in certain situations, and that goes for schools too. And we've been um, approaching it in schools as a very mask positive environment. And yes, there are some children that have difficulties with it. And we know that, especially younger children, it can be a challenge to keep it on and not play with it. And it's irritating. And some days you're, you're not feeling. So we need to have that positive reinforcement um, in schools. And I know educators and teachers are doing that in a, a really positive way. And that's how it needs to stay. Well, I will say for um, people who don't believe in masks, that they are not entitled to have the same access to those indoor environments. Accommodation could mean that uh, a grocery store can take your order online and have a drop off at the door. Um, so it does not mean just because you um, don't believe in masks that you can still do those same things in the same way um, because that could be putting others at risk. So yes, accommodation for people who are not able to wear a mask could be um, online shopping, uh, taking takeaway, etc. Um, 
and and the human rights commissioner has supported us in those uh, in those um, restrictions and ability to accommodate by but not necessarily doing everything that somebody who can wear a mask can do um, in terms of uh, the ski resorts uh, the vaccine card is in place for all of those uh, activities like uh, restaurants, like the restaurant in the, on the hill, etc. So the outdoor skiing environment we know is not the risky environment. Um, however, I would encourage all of the, the ski resorts to put in place those measures that uh, protect people as best possible. And now we'll send it over to Vancouver to hear from Minister Whiteside. Thank you. I, I just wanted to weigh in on the uh, on the uh, on the masking uh, uh, question and, the, and, and enforcement, and just to reiterate that I know how uh, how much uh, effort educators and school communities have put into creating positive uh, cultures around mask wearing uh, in in schools, including at, at the at the including at the younger in the younger grades, including in in, in K to three. And I know that. In many communities, this won't be a big shift because this is this is this is happening anyway, um, and I, we would expect that that positive uh, encouragement uh, will will continue to be the way in which um, the way in which school communities uh, approach this approach this question. It is very much as they have been doing throughout the throughout the past the past year, and I think it's been quite remarkable to see the degree to which. Uh, in many schools, um, students have really picked up on this notion of caring for one another and doing everything that they can do as well to uh, to pitch in with the effort. And for the next question, we'll go back to the phone lines and we go to Susanna De Silva, CBC. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Henry. Are you tracking instances of vaccinated parents and grandparents, for instance, catching COVID from their unvaccinated school-aged children? We're hearing from multiple vaccinated adults who have gotten COVID after classroom exposures. How big of a concern is that? Uh, so I, I'm not on an individual basis. Um, we do know there have been some instances, and sometimes it's very challenging to understand exactly who was the first person in the group um, who was infected. We have had some breakthrough, as we've seen on um, the numbers that we report. Of course, there's a, a breakthrough transmission, but I will say how important it is because we know that people who are vaccinated are much, much less likely to get sick, much less likely to get severely ill or hospitalized, uh, hospitalized and we presented those data as well, and that holds. So even if um, a child brings it home, we know that if your parents are protected, we know that if the grandparents are protected, um, they're much less likely to get severe illness and less likely to pass it on to others. So it is a challenge sometimes to know exactly who is transmitting to who, but we know as well that there are communities, um, Fraser East, we know in much of the north, communities in the interior where vaccination rates are not high enough and we have a lot of transmission in the community that it is going to continue to spread. So these are additional measures that will help us curtail that so that we can continue the all important in-class learning that, that children need. Susanna, do you have a follow-up? Uh, yes, thank you. Just uh, one quick thing first. To, if you could clarify as far as the timing, is this the renewed for K-3 ending at the, in the spring break, December, or spring break, rather, Christmas break, um, and then will you reevaluate it? Um, and then also, is there a role for rapid testing in trying to help us get through this fourth wave and the respiratory season outside of the industrial business settings? Should rapid tests be made available to people, parents, for instance, who've seen it done in the UK, who want to either rule COVID out quickly at home if they have symptoms, or perhaps catch it, rather than tying up resources at testing centers? Yeah, a really good question about that. Let me go back to the first one. This is will be in place to the end of this term, and we'll be using the data to understand where we are in the trajectory over the next few months. So I just want people to uh, not to wonder when this is going to end. The mask uh, order is in place until January, so that's uh, that's uh, uh, at least till then, um, depending on what happens in the next little while. And of course, we're hopeful that there will be vaccination for younger children um, in the coming months as well. So that will factor into how long we'll need to keep this up in in schools. Having said that, we know that this is respiratory season, which means there's lots of things circulating. And uh, it, it, masking does help to prevent other things as well. Um, and this year, we're, we're starting to see more circulation of other respiratory viruses than we saw last year. 
and uh, and influenza is likely to make much more of an appearance this year than last year. And we do have safe and effective influenza vaccines for children and especially school-aged children. And we know that influenza, and unlike COVID, can cause very serious illness uh, more commonly in children. So that's something to, to pay attention to. And influenza vaccinations will be available very soon too. Um, in terms of uh, rapid testing, yeah, the UK has a program where they're using uh, take-home, at-home lateral flow tests. And we don't have those uh, types of tests available yet in great numbers. They, there's been two uh, that have recently been approved for use in Canada by Health Canada, but they're not yet widely available. I think there's a role for that type of test for at-home testing. Right now, though, what we're doing is making available the gargle, the swish, swish and gargle test uh, to uh, school-age kids around the province, um, making it more available so, so that you can pick up the, the kits through uh, um, schools, pharmacies, and other places. It is a PCR-based test, so it's still a lab-based test. And one of the things that that helps us do is we our strategy moving into uh, the fall has been to be able to test for multiple viruses at once. So depending on the symptoms of the person going in for testing, we'll be testing for all of those. So COVID, uh, RSV, influenza, and, and some of the parainfluenzas as well. So that's uh, what we've been ramping up over the last little while, one for surveillance, but also so that we can tell uh, which are the viruses, uh, respiratory viruses that are causing the most illness in different parts of the province as we get through this next few months. For the next question, we go to Mary Griffin, Check News. Thank you very much. Um, Dr. Henry, I'm just wondering, is there a possibility that um, because you've been asked, of course, many, many times about the mask mandate and now uh, it's implemented until the end of the school year, that there's a possibility that in the days ahead we'll be hearing about a mandatory vaccine for teachers and staff in the school system because now we're hearing from the BCPF um, that they're not opposed to a, a mandatory vac vaccination. And are they not, the staff and teachers, also members of those communities where the um, COVID-19 um, infection rates are rising. Absolutely, and you know we um, absolutely <laughs> expect that uh, uh, all school staff take advantage of the prioritization that we gave to to school staff early on in the immunization program to to take advantage of the protection that it offers, not just them, but their community, their own families, as well as the school community. And uh, as I mentioned earlier, you know, my focus in terms of uh, provincial health officer orders around vaccination is on those highest risk settings where the, the risk to those who are exposed from workers um, is, is the greatest. And that, as you know, includes long-term care and assisted living, which is incredibly important. We uh, know more and more, even with fully vaccinated residents, um, unvaccinated uh, people introducing the virus into those settings is extremely dangerous and leads to, to um, unnecessary deaths. So that is our focus. Uh, we also have put in a requirement for masking as a condition of employment for all healthcare workers, recognizing as well that those are high risk environments for people um, who have uh, underlying health conditions and are more vulnerable to infection, to severe illness, and to death. It is um, an employer-employee relationship in many other settings, and we are seeing increasingly that employers are requiring vaccination um, in many different settings, and uh, school settings are no different. Do you have a follow-up, Mary? I do, thanks very much. You just mentioned um, the vaccinations um, for younger children, just wondering if there is any update on when parents could expect that for the under 12 group. And just following up at part two on Richard's question on the resorts, and you were you suggested that you would encourage all those resorts to have a vaccine card. Would you expand on that as well too? Okay, sorry, you get me. Uh, what was the first one again? <laughs> An update on the uh, vaccination for younger children under 12. <laughs> it's been a long week. Um, 
Uh, yeah, so uh, we know that uh, Pfizer has submitted uh, a part of their data package to the FDA. I know Health Canada is still waiting for that. Um, we expect it to be, so what, what happens is that they have, uh, they've done a number of press releases about their phase three trials and the effectiveness in, uh, of the vaccine, or uh, the efficacy of the vaccine in stimulating a strong immune response in children. Um, they need to submit that entire package, which shows all of the safety data and how well it worked and the immunogenicity data. So it's a, what we call a bridging study. Um, and then Health Canada reviews that. What we also know is that this is a new formulation, at least that's what we've been told. We don't have all the details yet and we won't until the, the data package is submitted. But we understand it's a smaller dose, so 10 micrograms uh, instead of 30 of the antigen and that it's likely to be uh, uh, reformulated so it's a fridge stable product, which is great news for us because that makes it a whole lot easier to distribute. Um, and uh, once the package is submitted to Health Canada, uh, history has shown that it takes several weeks for them to review all the safety data, all the effectiveness data, and they have to review the manufacturing, the safe manufacturing um, processes as well. So it may be as early as the end of October is what we're hearing, um, but it may take more time than that. But I am really hopeful that we will have vaccination for uh, younger, the 5 to 11 age group anyway, um, uh, before the end of this calendar year, and hopefully as early as the end of October. Um, in terms of the, the vaccine card, so our vaccine card program is very specific to, to the BC vaccine card program is very specific to certain settings. So if a ski, if you want to go to a bar or a pub or a restaurant or the, uh, the restaurant on the hill, then you need to have your vaccine card. Um, I would encourage all of the resorts to look at all of those settings where it might be uh, prudent for them to ensure that only vaccinated people are there. The risk is less when you're outside, we know that in smaller groups and when you're wearing uh, masks and goggles, etc. So um, for a short period of time on a gondola, you know, the risk is probably not the same as if you're sitting down inside without a mask on um, having a drink with a group of people. Next question goes to Robin Crawford, News 1130. So much for taking my question. I just wanted to switch gears with Thanksgiving coming up. What's the advice for families here in Metro Vancouver with getting together? Yeah, you know what the advice is, is get vaccinated right now so that you can get together safely with your family. Um, this is, we, this virus is still out there. And if you're going to have um, older members of your family coming together, then you want to make sure that everybody who comes into your household is immunized. We know there are additional restrictions in some parts of this province where there's more transmission in the community, and that means you can only have one, uh, five other people or one other household um, together uh, if they're not all fully vaccinated. The vaccine is our way to mitigate the risk across the board. So now's the time to start thinking about getting that vaccine so you can go home and visit with your granny and grampy or your, your uncles or sisters who are immune compromised or those people in your family that you need to protect from this virus. Do you have a follow-up, Robin? I do, yeah. And my second question is for Minister Whiteside. Uh, you just spoke a little bit about um, keeping that positivity in the classrooms with the mask mandate. But is there any specific advice you have for the younger age teachers um, with having the kids not playing with their masks and, and taking them off while sitting at, at their desks? Well, I, what I would say about that, I know that educators have a lot of experience of this now with COVID. This is the third school year uh, that we uh, that we are entering into uh, with, uh, with with COVID and with our safety plans in place. And so there is uh, there's considerable experience out there on the on the part of educators and. I, I think as Dr. Henry said, said earlier, it can sometimes be difficult for, for little kids, but I, I also think that there has been that, that many parents in many communities have worked very hard with their, with their children to get them used to the, to the notion of, uh, of mask wearing. And I see many little ones out there uh, in, uh, in, uh, when, they're, when they're shopping and such uh, wearing their masks. So I, you know, I think there, there can sometimes be challenges, but we have very skilled uh, and compassionate and smart 
uh, educators who uh, who've been working on this and who are going to continue to do that work with with the little ones. And for a final question, we go to Colton Davies, Radio NL. Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Sorry. Right. Bringing this up again, uh, as we've heard concerns from parents in recent days about cohorts, uh, some parents around here wanting cohorts to be brought back as a way to limit exposure uh, in elementary schools, particularly with the uh, grades that aren't vaccinated up to grade six and seven. Uh, is the province planning or even considering bringing back cohorts for elementary students, and why or why not? Sure, I'll start and then maybe I'll turn it over to my So we, we did a lot of looking at what were the things that worked and didn't work and what were the things that impeded um, schools from uh, having, uh, being able, uh, that caused more problems than, than benefit or impeded the working of the school. And so we had the concept of cohorts last year or learning groups um, that were different sizes depending on uh, uh, on the age of the children and the, and the school system. And uh, they, uh, we found that they weren't a tool that was needed to prevent transmission, and they caused significant challenges in operations uh, of schools at all levels. So this year, we, we've taken out that concept of, of the official cohort or learning group, but what schools have done is on a school-by-school -school basis looked at the measures that are important and the important things were um, reducing the mixing of, of, of grades in particular, reducing uh, the number of people in the school, uh, reducing uh, the group gatherings, whether it's assemblies and other things. So those are the things that they've looked at to try and um, make sure that we're having the effect that we want, which is to prevent transmission between large groups in the school setting and not impeding the, the operations and you know it, it made a, a big difference particularly in the older grades but uh, but also in the younger grades about which classes could be taught by which teachers and who could uh, who could take what classes um, so it, it was not found to be helpful in terms of, of disease control and it was found to be impeding the operations of schools so I think there's other measures that we're using now um, rather than having the official learning groups that we had put in place last year. And uh, Minister, maybe you want to talk to that as well. Yes, th thank you, Dr. Henry. And it's important to note that cohorts operated differently in middle and high schools than they did in elementary schools. And uh, there was, when, when public health uh, uh, determined in, in June, as part of our update in June, that uh, that it would not be, uh, cohorts would not be, learning groups would not be required. There was really unanimity around our, 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 edu our, our education sector table um, that that was a good thing because, um, uh, because it was, it posed very many challenges uh, in many respects for, for the, for, for learning particularly for, uh, and timetabling particularly for, uh, for, for grades, uh, uh, for the high school grades. Uh, with respect to elementary schools, as Dr. Henry pointed out, there are many uh, different mechanisms and ways that uh, that schools uh, can use that are that are enumerated in our that are listed out in our safety guidelines around managing um, uh, congestion and, and crowds in schools, and that has to do that 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 will be very much like how they operated last year, and it may be um, staggering time on the playground, it may be. Uh, staggering uh, recess times, uh, staggering uh, lunch break times, those kinds of things. So our um, our, uh, our our school uh, principals and school staff are very very used to and adept at that. Um, I uh, you know I think that there are uh, um, uh, there is also great attention being paid right now to um, uh, you know not not having assemblies of many hundreds of kids together. I think uh, that's um, uh, that people are being very careful out there about. Uh, respecting uh, how quickly we move back to some of those kinds of kinds of activities, and again, these measures will be supported by our uh, uh, health authority, school medical health officials who work, our officers who work very closely with school districts. They track what's happening in particular communities and work with the districts and the schools to put in those and encourage those put those in those particular recommendations around how to manage those issues. Such as we have in interior, the Interior Health Authority right now, we have a set of recommendations in place right now in Interior Health around limiting inter uh, gatherings inside schools, limiting visitors to schools 
because of the particular conditions, uh, the, the particular conditions there. So we 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 still uh, we still have those uh, those tools available. Colton, do you have a follow up? I do. Thank you. I know we've heard, and this would be for John Henry. I know we've heard from you and, and other officials that uh, we're in a pandemic now with the unvaccinated and. It was pointed out to me this week that includes uh, anyone under 12 years old and uh, most, well, elementary school-aged kids anyways. Um, and so I'm paraphrasing based on conversations I've had with parents in recent days, but uh, what would you say to, to parents, what, what assurances might you have for parents who feel that their elementary school-aged kids might be more at risk right now than last year based on uh, the Delta variant and uh, the parents I've talked to feeling that there are fewer safety measures in place uh, so far through this school year compared to last year? Yeah, you know, I, I hear you. I know there's a lot of anxiety as we're, you know, this pandemic goes on and on and it changes. And we've had to change and adapt as we've learned more, as we've seen a more transmissible variant. But I think uh, I can say with confidence that we are in a better place in our schools. That's because the adults in the school system have vaccination. and. The best thing that we can do that will keep our schools functioning is making sure that all of the adults and older siblings who are able to be vaccinated are. That protects the young kids, it protects the schools and keeps them open, but it also protects our family and our community. And that's what we need to do right now. We need to raise up all of our immunization levels because it is what makes us safer as a community. It means we're working together and it is that act of altruism that is going to get us through this. So even if you have concerns, get those questions answered. We're here to, to help answer those questions. This is about all of us working together and schools are an important reflection of how we're doing as a community working together. And there are many parts of, the, of this province where we need to do better. We need to support each other and get vaccinated. Thank you for listening today and thank you for supporting us with our sponsors. Please go to depictions.media for more information and click on our contact link and let us know how we can help, how we can help bring your story and help bring us to a better world. This show has been produced by Depictions Media. Please contact us at depictions.media for more information.